Good morning to you all once again. Praise God for you all. It's always a joy to see each of you in worship. Praise God for each of you. Before we start today, I want to ask you all a question, and I want you to answer it to yourselves and to your own heart. How do you feel? You're here in God's house, in his sanctuary, but we know God is everywhere and with us at all times. When we come here to this place, we realize more clearly that we are in his presence. Here we encounter God. We encounter Christ. Let's hear these words from the book of Acts concerning Paul's encounter with Christ and think about how he feels. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 20, the conversion of Saul. <coughs> Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument to whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Paul, actually at this time he is still known as Saul, has just encountered Jesus. For as much as we know, this is Paul's first encounter with Christ. He literally has been struck down and lies there helpless in front of the risen Messiah. Jesus, who is the Christ, stands before him. Christ, the one who will judge us all, stands in judgment of Paul. How do you think he feels? Paul has committed a grave, grave sin. He is persecuting Jesus' body, the church. We who follow Christ are the body of our Lord, and an attack on any of us is an attack on Christ. An offense toward any of us is an offense towards Christ. Paul has been working to disrupt, scatter, destroy the body of Christ. His goal has been nothing less than to drive people away from the Savior, their Savior. His goal, his sin, has been to try and steal salvation from those who are or who would follow Jesus. He lies there on, in, on the ground in a heap before the risen Christ. 
He lies there in judgment. His judge, our judge, stands before him. And suddenly he realizes all his sin, all his wrongdoings, all his filth. He realizes who he has been working against. How do you think he feels? Imagine yourself in his place. How do you feel now? Someday we all shall stand before the risen Christ in judgment. Suddenly, we, like Paul, on that faith-filled day, will see, will realize, will mourn over all the sins of our lives. Those sins will be scrawled out before us like the words written on a whiteboard. Imagine your sins written out one by one, one by one, one after another on a board, right before you, as you look on and you feel the weight of condemnation bearing down, down, down upon you. How do you feel now? Now to hold all of your sins, to hold the complete list of any one of us who are gathered here today, sins will need more space than this little board can provide. So imagine them spelled out, scrawled out on the walls before you, the walls beside you, the wall behind you, the ceiling above you, and the floor below you. And there is still not enough room. How do you feel? Now, when we start talking about sin, there are a couple of things that we humans love to do to protect ourselves from realizing our own guilt, from having to admit to ourselves that we will stand in judgment. First of all, we rationalize away our sin and insist that it really isn't a sin at all, but yet it's written on the wall. Strange, isn't it? Not really, because it's a sin. And deep down, you always knew it was a sin. You just didn't like to admit that, not to yourself, nor to your God. The other thing we do is we quickly point out that some other person has also committed the same sin, perhaps even the pastor. True, very true, other people have likely committed this sin of yours, probably no matter what sin you pick. But that's not really going to be your concern on that day. When you see it written on the wall before you, when it's you who stands before Jesus, when it's your judgment day, the fact that someone else has sinned isn't going to be the topic of discussion. It's your sin, your judgment. How do you feel now? Now there's a strange thing that happens when you employ either of these arguments. Those hope for trump cards that say that God is wrong. That thing he said was sinful isn't sinful for you. Or when you pull out the card that says it's not a sin if everyone or even just one other person is doing it. Or has done it as well. If society says it's okay, it can't be a sin. And even if it is a sin, it doesn't count because so many have committed the sin. Its sinfulness has surely worn off. Right? Yes, there's something strange about those two hope for trump cards. Are you all familiar with the game Monopoly? Well, I suspect that most of you are. The strange thing about either the it's not really a sin or the everyone is doing it cards are that when you turn them over, they both read. Don't pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to jail. Only in this case, instead of saying jail, it reads. How do you feel now? 
Normally I dislike listening to sins because I fear that if I mention a sin, someone will be inclined to say to themselves, well, I'm good as that's not me. I don't do that, so I'm all good. Much better than those awful, awful sinners. But today I think I'll mention a sinner too. But again, don't think this list is inclusive. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of other sins that will or are already scrawled on the wall that waits for you. But the sins I'm going to list might not be sins you think too much about, at least not while you're busy committing them. We'll skip over all those sexual sins since they seem to get all the attention, all the press, if you will. Not that they're not grievous sins, it's just that whether or not you're willing to admit they're a sin, you know what they are, and you know they're a sin. Before we jump into sin, though, let us remember what Jesus taught us was the greatest command, to love God and to love our neighbor. And let's also remember what Paul taught us about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4-7. to seven. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jesus called us to love one another, to give to each other, to endure each other, and for us to not do what God wants us to do is in fact Sin. To work against God is a sin. So what is it that keeps us from loving one another? What is it that causes us to ignore God's will for the world and our lives? I would suggest that it's largely my old nemesis, ego. Ego seems to be behind so many sins. It's the emotion and attitude that Satan uses to such success in disrupting our lives and our church family. The church body. God wants us to love one another. We're called to love one another. So let's look at what Paul says about love and see where we've fallen away, where we've sinned by not living up to what God has called us to do and to be. Love is patient and kind. You always treat others with patience. You tolerate other people when they annoy you. Some people will rub you the wrong way. But I guess but guess what? Jesus called you to love them anyway. And that means you need to be patient, always. Are you kind? Are you kind even to those who are not so kind to you? Perhaps even someone who's wronged you? Are you jealous? Much of the reason why we must treat others has an element of jealousy behind it, and that's entirely an offshoot of ego. We want to knock some people down a notch or two. Only problem is, that's a sin. Are there any writings on the wall that you missed before? Are there more words coming into focus? How do you feel now? Are you boastful or arrogant? Have you ever thought you were better than another? Have you ever thought that you were more important for the body of Christ than another believer? Probably the greatest sin I've ever heard proclaimed was that the body would be better off without such and such. Let them leave. Do you really think that one portion of the body of Christ is greater than another? That's not what Paul told us. And all believers are a part of the body of Christ. If you think that one part is expendable, then you think Christ is expendable. If you've ever thought these things, you're guilty of the sin of arrogance. Remember what is said on the back of the card. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to, well, that lake of fire. If by your arrogance or malice you drive another from the church, you might very well, actually all too often, you might have soured them on the church and just driven them from a relationship with Christ altogether. And for all time. And for all eternity. Their falling away is a result of your actions. On their day of judgment, they will come up laughing 
And on your day of judgment, their name will be scrawled on your wall. And you will be called to task as you stand before Jesus himself on your judgment day. How do you feel now? Love does not insist on its own way. In your interactions with others, do you always insist on getting your own way? Do you push or bully others to submit to your plan, your ideas, your way of doing things? Or do you allow a conversation and consideration to play out so that we might discern how God wants us to proceed? Often we argue and fuss over the most minute of details. And when we interject our own parameters, such as performing the project or meeting within a set time limit, rather than allowing the process of discernment to proceed, we're putting our egos, ideas, and agendas ahead of accomplishing God's plans. Blocking God's discernment to others, insisting on your own agenda, is momentarily rejecting God. And rejecting God is a sin. Scripture tells us that rejecting the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin. Anytime we reject God's direction in order to pursue our own selfish agenda, we sin. Anytime our actions work against God's plan, we sin. Do you see any more writing on the wall? How do you feel now? Love is not irritable. This one is hard. Do you ever allow yourself to be irritated in another? You are, we all are, called to be tolerant of each other. If you submit to your base emotions and consciously or unconsciously lash out at another, you might very well once again drive them away from the faith. You might well cause them to fall away. Your ego that allows you to be irritated might well condemn another to the lake of fire. But don't forget, it's not, not just about them. As for you two, we're back to that monopoly metaphor. Do not collect $200 or directly to. How do you feel now? Love is not resentful. Resentment is a poison that eats away at your soul. And since hopefully you now see that it's a sin, you realize that if you refuse to let go of it, it will also steal away your salvation. Do not resent another for a past slight or wrong. Are you holding on to an old, old grudge? Do you even wear that old grudge like a badge of honor? Jesus died on the cross. Remember that it was just a couple of weeks ago that we raised the cross on Good Friday. We reenacted the placing of Christ on the cross. He died on the cross so that your old sins were no longer held against you. Why do you hold on to resentment and old, and old grudges? Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't I have had mercy, or shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Matthew also told us more bluntly earlier in his Gospel, Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
Many of us seem to almost enjoy holding on to resentment and old arguments. We hold on to them for years, even decades. If you are holding on to resentments, clinging to them, well then, look at the walls. Do you see any more writing appearing before you? The words just keep piling up. They just keep coming. How do you feel now? Love does not rejoice at wrong. Some of us seem to really enjoy catching others in mistakes. In fact, we'll hang back and not warn someone or not remind someone about something just so we can gloat in pointing out their mistake after the fact. There's almost a perverse glee in this for some. You can hear it in their voice, you can see it in their eyes, in their body language. This is a form of belittling and betrays a lack of care and concern for others. It's the exact opposite of kindness. And this again is a sin. Is it written on your wall? Don't lie. Don't lie to yourself and don't lie to God. Is it there? How do you feel now? Sin is simply the betrayal of God's commandments. To put our own understanding and agenda before God's. Christ told us that the greatest commandment was love. Again, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. To break the greatest commandment would be to commit the greatest sin of all. When we, by not loving one another, by not forgiving one another, drive another away from church and away from the loving arms of God, we are genuinely and truly condemning another to hell. And don't forget that we ourselves drove through that same car. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to hell. How do you feel now? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But let's get back to Paul. We left him in the middle of the road. Paul lies there, a guilty man, before the judgment throne. Yet he has an opportunity. Jesus is giving him a second chance. Jesus is calling Paul to a new way of life, a new mission in life. He is to literally rise from the ground and into this new life in service of God, in service to Jesus. Paul had a second chance that day so long ago. He realized the error of his ways. He acknowledged his sins, and he turned toward the living God. He turned to Christ. Each of us was given a second chance on that Easter morning so long ago. But a very real aspect of that second chance is our acknowledging, just as Paul did, that our sins are, in fact, sins. We need to do everything we can to confess, walk away from our sins, and repent, and walk back to God. To walk towards the cross, and not away. Whenever we sin, we are not only adding or writing on that wall that will face us someday, we're moving away from the grace of Christ. You have been given a second chance. How do you feel now? Acknowledge your sins, all that writing upon the wall. Admit it to yourself that you are in fact, they are in fact sins. Then repent and return to Jesus. And do everything you can to do to bring more souls to Christ. And never ever do anything to drive someone, anyone, not even yourself, away from the church and away from God. Jesus' final instructions in Matthew's Gospel are Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. We've come now to the time of sharing.